Good evening, I'm Kevin Sturr, and uh, I'm a longtime member of the Faculty and Residence Program. It's a real pleasure tonight to introduce a truly fascinating guy. Chris Nowinski is a co-director of the Center for the Study of Trauma Tra Traumatic Encephalopathy at Boston University's School of Medicine. He's also the co-founder and executive director of the Sports Legacy Institute, which is a nonprofit organization dedicated to solving the sports concussion crisis through education, policy, and research. Chris was an all-Ivy defensive tackle for the Harvard University football team, and he later debuted as Chris Harvard, a professional wrestler with World Wrestling Entertainment. Chris now serves as an advisor to the NFL Players Association, the Ivy League Multi-Sport Concussion Committee, and Major League Lacrosse. He's also a doctoral candidate in behavioral neuroscience at Boston University's School of Medicine. Chris Nowinski. Thank you. Thank you very much for the introduction and for inviting me here. I tell you what, I'm, I'm excited that you guys are here. I mean, this is a voluntary thing. This is an amazing crowd. I know Dr. McKee's a good draw. But we're going to have some fun tonight, all right? So I want to kind of push the envelope a little bit. I put together a new talk that I've never done before. So I hope you like it. And, the, and actually, the question about kids really sets it up well. Um, so you know, my, my question is, is with what Dr. McKee just showed us, and I, you know, I work with her, I recruit these brains for her, uh, and on my tombstone, my greatest accomplishment will be that I recruited Dr. McKee to CT research. But if what, if what she said is true, is, is being great at football a blessing or a curse? And I want to look at that from an exposure uh, issue, to exposure to an environmental risk factor, which is brain trauma. Now, why? Well, because the better you are at football, the longer you're going to play, right? I mean, it's just, it's just the nature of the beast. If you're good, they'll, you'll play forever. And the longer you play, the greater risk you have of developing CTE. So that's the premise. Now, you, you heard my story. I played a little bit of ball at Harvard. That's me trying to take credit for someone else's sack. There's me doing a dance after my own. Uh, so that's, that was the highlight of my life. And then I wonder now if I was lucky that I wasn't good enough to go into the NFL. And that would be true from an exposure standpoint if I hadn't have chosen to go into wrestling. But I did. So this is me at the Boston Garden uh, 10 years ago. Oh, no, don't tell me it doesn't work. Can you guys make that work? <laughs> I was going to show you a wrestling video. Jeez, oh, we didn't test it. OK, forget it. But I, uh, it was me crushing people. Um, <laughs> that was me getting a concussion. All right, I got a lot of concussions wrestling. So the analogy is that we need to kind of think about is brain trauma is an environmental risk factor for later life neurological problems. And I want to think about that and compare it to smoking research, because smoking is an environmental risk factor for developing lung cancer, right? We know that. That's established, right? And if we put those two things on equal terms, we can have an interesting discussion around who plays football, when, and how. Now, I'm not trying to pick on football. It's not the only thing that causes concussions, although it does cause, uh, has a higher rate than just about everything, and it does cause the majority of concussions in youth athletes, right? More, fo more kids play football, and they get more concussions. So in like the state of Minnesota, it's 42% of all concussions in high school sports is football. So this is something we need to discuss. Uh, and in terms of appreciating what we know about smoking research, uh, we need to look at uh, this curve here. This is a study from uh, about 2003 looking at variations in lung cancer risk. And what they found was uh, what was an enormous risk factor was how many years you smoked. Right? Look at that curve. It just goes off the charts the longer you smoke. Under 10 years, not a huge risk. Once you get above 20, it just starts shooting through the moon. All right? And interestingly, it's not, it's not how many cigarettes you smoke. So the football analogy would be, well, is it how many concussions you get? Maybe not. Maybe it has more to do with the years you play. Look at the differences between those curves. Right? And that is actually what... So far, Dr. McKee's research appears to be showing. So, and exactly, if you think about this from that a cultural context, what do we do to protect ourselves against environmental risk factors? Well, I'll give you an example. And I've never done this before. But 
if I were, say, to take this cigarette and light it, all right, this, this is illegal. This is actually illegal on campus and a fine. Not because it's a risk for me, but because it's a risk for you. One cigarette. I'm gonna have to pay the university, I think, 75 bucks. I looked it up. And I'm okay with that, all right? So think about this, all right? When I grew up, this smoke was everywhere. This is all I, this is all that's around. But now it's illegal to smoke indoors. I'll put it out now. Now I can't drink. I'll try to remember not to drink this thing. Okay. So, 10 bucks for this. Make one cigarette joke. All right, so, so, think about, oh, would this video's not gonna work too now? Gosh, bless America. So, anyway. So, this is a video of two eight-year-olds bashing the heck out of each other, okay? That's legal, all right? That's legal, smoking is not, okay? So just putting that forward, all right? The question we have to face is, if this, impact, this, this hit that you would have seen, increases the child's risk for later life, depression, memory disorders, dementia, CTE, how do we encourage it? All right, how are we as a culture encouraging this? How are one in eight boys playing this? How is the NFL subsidizing this? All right, we need to talk about it. One in eight boys. And you have to think about this, not from, not, you know, again, nothing about this says the NFL has to stop. All right, and I'm not saying, you know, adults can do a dangerous job if they want to. I did that. But we're talking about children here. And we have to appreciate that children have tremendous disadvantages when it comes to brain trauma and when it comes to playing contact sports like football. Some examples, it's a short list. Their brains are still developing. They have a lack of myelination. It's bad to traumatize a growing brain. Um, they are, their brains are more sensitive to the chemical changes that come with concussion. So that's why we think they recover longer. They might have more longer term problems. Uh, they have weak necks, so if we look at biomechanics, their weak necks don't distribute force to the body well. Um, they, have, they, they have weak torsos when they fall backwards. If you actually watch kids fall, the younger they are, the more likely they are to hit their head. They have a giant head, uh, little neck. And think about that giant head. Kids are basically human bobbleheads. You can kind of see it here. It's easier to see when you put these two together. Which one's the toy? I don't know. It's hard to tell, all right? The reality is your head size when you're born is, is almost full size, but your body is tiny. At age four, you know, you have 20% mass. And so it makes this kind of critical window between four and 12 where your mass is slowly catching up to your giant head. So you sh probably shouldn't hit kids in the head because you end up getting that huge biomechanics. We now know that eight-year-olds can hit each other in the head as hard as college football players, right? It, it looks like a pillow fight, but it's not. And then you add on uh, poor equipment, you add on no doctor on the sideline, no athletic trainer there to help you out, and then you add on um, the inability to uh, understand concussions and therefore report them to an adult. Like, does a six-year-old understand that headache they have, or those few minutes of stars were significant enough to pull themselves out of a game and tell their coach? Uh, we can't even teach adults to do this. Right? There is a new study done by one of our graduate students, Christine Bosch. She surveyed 730 Division I football players, asked them three questions. How many concussions did you have last year? How many concussions do you think you had but weren't diagnosed? And how many times you dinged or got your bell rung? For every one concussion that were diagnosed with, they said there were six times that they were pretty sure they were concussed but didn't say anything. But they also had 21 dings. So the reality is one out of every 27 likely concussions was diagnosed last year in Division I college football among these eight teams. That's frightening, all right? But it goes throughout sports. Uh, in ice hockey, a survey that I was involved with, uh, led by Emily Crocious, six Division I teams, 19% of them were diagnosed with concussions, but they swore they had three times as many, all right? They didn't report them. They don't report dizziness. They don't report seeing stars. They don't report the headaches, okay? The number one reason why is 70% of them don't think a concussion is serious enough to report. And these are kids after having concussion education who are 18 to 22 years old. So to think that we can really appreciate, I get teach a 10-year-old what's going on. The average 10-year-old thinks they have to be knocked out to have a concussion. The average 10-year-old, uh, only 45% can, can name zero or one symptoms of concussion. So they really have no idea what's happening to them out there when they get hit in the head. And then we f finish up with uh, 
coaches with various levels of training, which is why what John does is so important, and then lack of informed consent. And this is kind of the big elephant in the room, right? We're exposing these kids to an environmental risk factor for which they don't understand and they can't appreciate and they can't legally take on that consent. And so, um, you know, and I think about it, everyone's, you know, even when we say the NFL athletes know what they're getting into, the first time they got hit in the head playing sports, they didn't, all right? They were a child, they were a minor, every single one of them. And so we have to appreciate and respect the cultural impact of this, right? They got into the football world and they got into a world where once you get in, they'd be little quitters, right? I was there, you quit, you're soft, your friends disown you. So it's really, if you look at it from that perspective, an odd thing, right? We, we get kids in there and then we tell them they can't get out and you play as long as you're good enough to play. So that is the machine in a lot of ways. So we need to start thinking about age appropriate sports. That's where this discussion is going. You can't teach curveballs in baseball till age 12 to protect elbows, all right? This is the safest country in the world for a young boy to have an elbow, but it might be the most dangerous for a brain because there's no limit, you know, there's no age limits for football. There's no pitch counts in football. I mean, the brain is probably more important to their future than the elbow, but we've been focusing on their elbow, all right? Ice hockey, no, we, they finally raised the age of checking. No checking till 13. No intentional hits till 13. Good job, ice hockey. Lacrosse, all hits to the head are now illegal, all right? Soccer, well, they say no headers till 10, but nobody enforces it. We're now pushing very hard to raise that to high school. It's called our Safer Soccer Campaign. We have legends like Brandy Chastain and Cindy Parlo Cone and some other really high profile folks saying, if we wanna make better soccer players and have fewer kids retire at 12 from soccer, from concussions, let's just eliminate it because they don't need to know it before high school. They're not even athletic enough to head it in any general direction that they want to. So, uh, and then you have to then look at football. What's football's answer? I think football's answer is if you look at this data, why aren't we endorsing flag and pushing them for seven on seven with no tackling before high school, all right? Um, you know, if what Dr. McKee showed us, you know, again, think about that. If the longer you play, the worse off you are. So maybe what we should do is shorten careers on purpose by raising the age that you start. So look back at this curve, okay? This is where you would be. Let's, let's just say this is the CTE curve because it probably won't be that different once Dr. McKee figures it out. When are you gonna have that done, by the way? Um, so if you, play, if you play high school, you started at five years old, you're gonna play 12 years, all right? If you're good, you can play another five years in college because they'll redshirt you, and then you might play uh, a dozen years if you're good. So you get 30 years in the NFL. Look at the difference between that risk, right? This is, looks really high relative to the high school, but the high school is still a risk. And again, these are all minors that are getting exposed to this risk. Well, if we decided to ban tackle and eliminate these thousand hits to the head that these kids are taking, not unlike eliminating a thousand cigarettes, um, what would happen is the risk would cur move dramatically. Uh, you move that over, you move the NFL group over, and suddenly the new risks are much, much lower. NFL would be half, which would be great, and then the, the high school risk would be four years or less, really, really small relative to what it is now. And, and, and that's what, you know, as an advisor of the NFLPA, that's what actually I've been pushing. The only way, the, the, the next best thing you can do to make NFL players safe has nothing to do with the changes to the game at the NFL level. It's making them safe when they're kids, when they don't have, again, all those, they have all those disadvantages and nothing there to protect them. So that is what I am proposing, is if what she showed us uh, is, is real, and we all know it is, um, then being great at football can, while it might be a blessing in your wallet, will be a curse for your brain and maybe a curse for your family. As Dr. Mickey mentioned how these, these stories go and she didn't even hit you with the hardest one. So the answer is probably to keep from being cursed, let's begin purposeful brain trauma in children in all sports at a later age. And that should be a cultural change. It's just not a good idea to hit kids. We all know it. Uh, the reason we do it, if you look at actually football and youth football, has no, less to do with uh, people think it's a good idea. And I was actually talking to a reporter on her way in uh, who was remarking on how most NFL executives have their kids play flag. They know, right? 
But, uh, but the football industrial complex uh, encourages kids playing. And if you're a youth organization, you can't say there should be an eight, if you can't say instead of five, let's start at eight, because they all know, since there's no one governing body, all the kids who want to play between five and eight will go to another league. And then enrollment goes down, and then you get fired. That's the trap we're in. So it's an interesting trap, an interesting societal problem, but I hope we fix it. So I want to thank you so much for the opportunity to share this with, idea with you, and I look forward to your questions. Thank you. How do you redefine the manhood? <laughs> oh, easy, I got that. You know, you're redefining toughness, I agree. And, and I honestly think what you have to say, what you have to step up and say is it's manlier to protect kids from injuries than to expose them for own amusement. You know, and, and start having those conversations. I mean, John Madden told Commissioner Goodell, you know, to his face on an NFL Network panel, why are we, as the NFL, encouraging seven-year-olds and eight-year-olds to play tackle football? I mean, so there are men that are redefining manhood as protecting kids. And my first comment is that um, I and a lot of other people would suggest that football has as many concussions as they do relative to rugby because football is a game of yards and not possession. In rugby, you can have like you know 20 or 30 um, goes in the same drive until you score or not. And in football, you know that you have a every 10 yards is another opportunity to continue um, pushing your score. Um, so that's why you see a lot of these hits. Where in rugby, it's easy to go down and it doesn't hurt your team, but in football, that that another half yard really helps. Um, so I wonder, I wonder how much of the research goes into those game mechanics. And then my other comment would be that um, a reason I, I feel like flag football or the seven on seven modules for children's football wouldn't be so popular or work so well is that um, when you watch youth football, about 96 or 97 percent of the plays they run are run plays where there are 10 people up front and one kid gets the ball and runs through the middle of them and there's one kid on the outside who's just a decoy and never gets the ball thrown to him. And you can't really do that in flag football because in a run play, the idea is to shed the tackler and go, but in flag, they're always going to get your flag. And so I wonder if they're learning all these techniques of blocking properly um, and things like this in tackle football where they wouldn't learn these mechanics so much in flag football how that would then translate over to their skill sets in high school, college, and eventually the NFL, where, now here comes my question, where the, the, the NFL has more power over America than like most presidents have had, and the, the Super Bowl has more viewers than any other TV program over the course of their entire year. And so, how much resistance has there been, and if you'd be transparent, how much resistance do you expect there to be from the NFL in saying, we're making so much more money right now off the way the game is run, and we're getting so much abuse from radio stations saying quarterbacks wear skirts now and you can't hit them the way they used to. At what point is the NFL going to say, we've seen all the research and we don't care, our business works? Do, um, I guess that's the qu a long question. but <laughs> Sure. I've had a lot of concussions, by the way, so I may not get all the way to the first question. Uh, last question is, you know, we, we fought the NFL for years. You know, we went to congressional hearings on this in 2009, and two of them. So, um, you know, that story is kind of out there, and I would rec recommend you see the documentary Head Games, if you haven't, that was based off of a book I wrote that really goes through that battle that we had. So it's been a battle. It'll probably continue to be a little bit of a battle. You know, we, we, we work together on some things, we don't on others. Um, going back to the question of skill set and how they transfer, my answer, my honest answer is who cares? 
who cares how good they are at 12 years old? You know, reality is, and, and as a football guy, I can tell you that your skills you pick up at 10 do not translate to anything. I, I started playing in high school, thank God, because my mom wouldn't let me because she was worried about my knees. Uh, but I was captain of the team at the second practice, the same the first day, because I was just an athlete. But the other thing is, you know, football when you, at the upper level is all about strength. You know, using your hands, pushing people off. Kids can't even do that. So that's why they, you know, they're going to hit heads more. So when I look at skills, I don't, I don't want to expose kids to this risk factor just to build up a skill at something that 1% of them will ever make money on. And then before I answer the last question, I do have one pitch to you guys. <laughs> All right. Um, just so you know, we do have an opportunity here um, how you might be able to make a difference if you're thinking about this. We put a program called SLI Community Educators at universities. We've had it here. At, it's now at 10 universities where we train college students to go into the community and train kids on concussions, fourth to 12th grade, on a simple 30-minute program we train you on that the kids love. We're going to be moving our BU's chapter, which is our first, from the med campus to the undergrad campus. Uh, Mark Larson hopefully will be leading that chapter. Yes, sir. So uh, this is the kind of stuff you do. There's 600 kids on the south side of Chicago. Um, great results. 93% of students say they're more likely to tell a friend or coach they have a concussion. 89%. More likely to tell a coach if they think a teammate has a concussion, which is a critical thing to teach them. So just as a last point, because we don't teach kids that. This quote was from a Harvard uh, team doctor from a book from before my time. In any case, any man gets hurt by a hit to the head, so does not realize what he's doing. His teammate should at once insist that time be called and a doctor come on the field to see what's the trouble. Was anyone ever asked to do this when they were an athlete? Call time out if they think their teammate has a concussion? No. They're still not. You saw the University of Michigan game Saturday, for those of you in, in the business, and saw a O lineman holding up his quarterback and leaving him in the game. So the funny thing is this was a quote from 1905 from the diary of Bill Reed. This is what we used to do. So now we're putting it back into play through this training program. So long story short, we want students. And if you guys are interested in this, uh, Cliff Robbins uh, is in the back. Look around. Look at handsome Cliff waving his hand. If you're interested, he has one pagers to give you to give you information. We'll talk afterwards. So anyway, sorry to sneak that one in there, but this is for the good of kids. Um, uh, so yeah. So maybe I'll end it on that. Does that work? Yeah. You like that? All right. Thank you very much. <laughs>